Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'd like to begin reading with you today from Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start reading in verse 35. Romans 8, 35, Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then I won't ask you to turn to it, but in Matthew chapter 16 and 18, we have these words of the Lord Jesus, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. We're in the midst of a sermon series that we're calling Things Unseen. And the Bible says that the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So we're taking some time this summer to look at things that are eternal and to look at things that are unseen. Pastor Glenn started us, uh, started us off a couple of weeks ago with a look at the angels. And then last week I shared about the devil and his demons. Do make sure that you're with us next weekend as we'll be sharing about spiritual warfare. But this week is another important topic. We're going to be shining the light of scripture on the kingdom of darkness and see how it operates. Now church, this is a serious topic. It is not something that we're always comfortable talking about. But I want you to know that it's an important topic nonetheless for us as believers to understand so that we can better recognize the work of the enemy. Church, God does not want you to be naive. Don't be a spiritual ostrich. How many of you know what ostriches do? Don't hide your head in the sand where it concerns the devil. The Apostle Paul said that he was not ignorant of the devil's devices. And that word means his plans and his thinking. So today we want to share with you on this topic, the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail. Let's pray and ask God's help as we look into his word together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving to us your holy word, Lord. It's a lamp for our feet and a light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Lord, we pray that our hearts might be good soil right now, that we can receive and retain the word of God and bear good fruit. Jesus said that the words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. So, Father, we pray that you would send the Holy Spirit and minister life from the word of God to us now. Send us the help of your holy angels as we share. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ is building his church. It's his most important project. The church is the thing that is most dear to his heart. And we possess a personal promise from Jesus that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church which he is building. People often wonder what that expression means. Cities no longer have gates and walls as they did in ancient times. And so the expression gates of hell may not be very obvious to us. We've all seen enough movies to know. You know, we've all seen the Lord of the Rings and things like that. And so we know that city gates were a defensive structure. And yet the gate was also the place of judgment, the place of counsel and planning. The elders of the city would meet in the gates and discuss its plans and discuss and formulate a plan for the future. Now, where you and I live, there may be a mayor, there may be a town council, a zoning board, a planning board, and all of those things. But in ancient Israel, in many ancient cultures, there were elders and there were judges who sat in the gates of the city and fulfilled those functions and made decisions for the life of the community. When Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against the church, we tend to think about warfare and plundering hell and freeing people from the devil's grip and all those things. And there's certainly truth in that. 
But if you understand the other function of the city gates, then you know that there is another meaning to Jesus' words. The gates is where plans and purposes were formulated. And so Jesus was also telling us when he said this, that the church would survive and overcome. That we would survive and overcome all of the schemes of the enemy, all of the plans that Satan has developed against us, so to speak, in the gates of hell. Today we're going to examine those gates. We're going to look at the devil's kingdom and study a little bit about how it operates. There are five things that the Lord wants you to know about the enemy's kingdom. Five, thing God, five things God wants you to know about the enemy's kingdom. And the first one is this. Understand that the devil runs a copycat kingdom. Understand that the devil runs a copycat kingdom. What is the structure of Satan's kingdom? He's running a copycat kingdom operation. The Bible gives us a good amount of detail about the angels, I think, but probably not enough to satisfy our curiosity. But one thing that is clear is that there are different ranks and different types of angelic beings. As we've talked about, they differ from one another in authority, in their ability, and in the assignments that they have from God. And this shouldn't surprise us because we know that our great God is not only a God of order, but he's a God of great variety. You know that God made about 200,000 species of beetle. Why? We shared about how the devil caused up to one-third of the angels to follow him in his rebellion. And in his madness, the devil would love for his counterfeit kingdom to conquer the kingdom of God. Well, it's not going to happen. He would love to replace God's authority with his own authority and rule through his chosen servants. And Satan has his own authority structure with a hierarchy of evil spirits all set up in imitation of God's angelic armies. Satan is an imitator. He wants to copy God. He boasts that he will be like God. The Bible says that he transforms himself. He presents himself to us as an angel of light. The Bible also says that he has false apostles who transform themselves. They present themselves to you as the apostles of Christ. He copies God and he counterfeits what is good. At the top of his pyramid of authority, of course, he has placed himself. And he desires to be on God's level and receive the honor that belongs only to the Lord. I'm sure he would love to evict the Lord from the throne of glory, but it's never going to happen. Below the devil is a demonic chain of command that he has instituted. And every successive rank is kept in place by fear. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul spells out for us in a very well-known passage a few things about the enemy's kingdom. Paul says, we wrestle not, our struggling is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If I didn't know Jesus, that would terrify me. And this passage reveals four levels or categories of evil spirits that Paul was unveiling for us. First is principalities, a principality. Now, we don't use this word a lot nowadays. We don't use it in America, really. It means the territory of a prince. If it helps you to get a handle on it, think about it this way. A prince has a principality, just like a king has a kingdom. That's what it means. And this describes for us the geographic division of Satan's kingdom. Different territories come under different princes, each one having a host of demons under him. When we read the book of Daniel, we can see that there was a time that Daniel the prophet prayed and fasted, but his prayers were opposed by one of these demonic princes. In Daniel chapter 10, an angel of God explained what was happening in the heavenly realms when Daniel was praying. Now listen, the angel said, do not fear Daniel, because from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Isn't that good news? When you begin to pray, your words are heard. And the angel said, I've come because of your words. That's also good news. But then he told Daniel a strange thing. He said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 
for 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. When Daniel began to fast, God sent an angel to him. But the prince of Persia wrestled against that angel and delayed him until Michael came to help him get through to Daniel. Church, I think this is one more reason why we need to be sure that we never quit in our praying. Don't ever give up in your praying. Maybe some of what you've been praying for is being opposed in the heavenlies. So you need perseverance. Keep praying and don't give up. Now, you may not like that. You may not like pulling back the curtain and seeing what may be happening in prayer. But there it is in black and white. Of course, these things depend upon the importance of what it is that we're praying about. Does the evil demonic prince of New York City come down and try to stop you from getting a good parking space? Well, some of you would probably say, yes, he does. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. However, do you think that those princes will try to divide churches? Do you think that they will try to stop evangelistic outreaches and stop the gospel from going forth in a certain region? I definitely think that they will. Another category of spirit Paul talks about is powers or authorities. We don't know much about these powers, but it's been suggested that they have influence over different facets of human activity and life. One might be in charge of crime in an area. Others might influence governments or churches or commerce and all these things. Their name simply means one that has authority. A third category is what Paul calls rulers of the darkness of this age. The Greek seems to indicate that this is the highest level of demonic spirit next to Satan himself. It can literally be translated as world rulers of this present darkness. And that sounds pretty imposing, doesn't it? These are the fallen angels who rule the world system together with Satan. They're his inner circle, his board of directors, if you like. Perhaps a spirit, a powerful spirit, such as we see in scripture under the name of the spirit of Antichrist or something like that, which has a worldwide influence, comes under this heading. Finally, Paul mentions the fourth group, wicked spirits or spiritual hosts, spiritual armies of wickedness. This seems to be a reference to all the hosts of demons who serve under these powerful princes. They have a variety of functions and a variety of abilities. The New Testament reveals for us when you read the Gospels, when you see the book of Acts, we see that there are many different types of demons and the Bible describes them to us in terms of the different effects that they have on people. They cause different sicknesses. When you read the Gospels, you see Jesus delivering people who have, for example, spirits of blindness and spirits of deafness and things of that sort. They can lead people astray into error and they can even enable people to perform false miracles in order to lead people astray. Boy, lunch is going to be a relief today, isn't it? That's the structure of the enemy's kingdom, and it's a rebellious imitation of God's army, which waits on him and serves God and serves the people that God loves. Aren't you glad? Thank God that his angels, the Bible says, they are all ministering spirits who are sent forth to minister for us, to minister for people who will be the heirs of salvation. So number one, God wants you to understand that the devil runs a copycat kingdom. And number two, God wants you to understand the devil's ungodly goals. Understand the devil's ungodly goals. You know, the devil never wakes up in the morning and has to ask himself, what should I do today? Paul says that he has devices in his mind. It means thoughts and purposes and intentions. He has ungodly goals which motivate him. Satan is driven by hatred of God and hatred for anything that God cares about, especially human beings who are made in the likeness of God. Anything that God chooses, Satan hates and is jealous of. He hates Jewish people. He hates Christian people. Consider this. Our closeness to God causes jealousy to the enemy. It absolutely must infuriate the enemy of our souls that as we're sitting here listening to the word of God today, on the throne of the universe is a resurrected man, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, God and man joined together in one person, the Lord of glory. I think that makes the devil furious. And so he hates Jesus and he tries to make men treat the wonderful name of Jesus like a curse word instead of the beautiful object of worship, which it really is. Everything that your enemy does is calculated to injure the heart of God and to stop the plans of God from coming to pass. If the devil could cause the promises of God to fail in any way, he would cause God to be faithful and his word would cease. What are his goals? First, his first goal is to stop the spread of the gospel. To stop the spread of the gospel. A primary goal of the enemy is to stop the great commission. If he can do this, if he can stop people from obeying Jesus' command to go to all the nations and share the good news, then people will remain as captives of the enemy. If Jesus' command to us to share the gospel is ignored, the Lord Jesus will be retained. He will be held and remain in the heavens. Say, Pastor Nick, what are you talking about? Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness. And then, everybody say then. And then the end will come. Hmm. Think about that when you're digging into your ziti in a couple of hours. The most vicious activities of the devil today are seen where? At the frontiers of missions work. Wherever the gospel is colliding with Islam, with Hinduism, with atheism, with any other ism that is floating around out there, you're going to see powerful demonic opposition. Another goal of the enemy is this, discrediting the God of the Bible. Discrediting the God of the Bible. You know, for over 100 years now, Christians, particularly Christians in the Western world, have been enduring onslaughts against the Bible. Satan is seeking to discredit God by making people think that the Bible is out of date, inaccurate, or old-fashioned. We're being swamped with ridiculous theories and ridiculous books which deny Christ and the Bible. I don't know what you think, but this, this has got to be the only country in the world where every Christmas and Easter, all the magazines run cover stories to say that none of it's true. Many people no longer believe in a creator, and instead they claim that we are the product of random collisions of molecules. If you think that that's true, then why don't you go out and buy a couple of old Ford Pintos and smash them together and see if a Ferrari comes out. <laughs> don't be intimidated by the mockers and by the scoffers. See, the Word of God prophesied to you that before the coming of the Lord that mockers and scoffers would come. But Jesus said, heaven and earth will certainly pass away. But he said, but my words will never pass away. Another goal of the devil is this, destroying the testimony of the church. Destroying the testimony of the church. I hope you love me still after this one. One way to block the gospel is to destroy the ministry and testimony of the church. When Christians fight each other. When Christians sue one another. When Christians fall into public sin and ministries are discredited. All of these things are provoked by the enemy. I didn't say the enemy does them. We do them. But we don't mind getting a little push sometimes from the enemy. All of those things are provoked by the enemy. Why? So that the Lord's church will become an object of ridicule. You know the story of King David and how he fell into sin with Bathsheba. And the Lord was angered. The Bible says that when David did that, that it gave an opportunity for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the Lord. God help us that it may never be so with us. Let's pray for a pure church like we see in the book of Acts. You know, in the book of Acts, it says that the common people gladly listened to the believers. Think about that. Make it an object of your prayers that the church will be held in high regard. Doesn't mean that they necessarily will believe everything you say, but let's make it our prayer that the church will be held in high regard because of its purity. A final goal of the devil's kingdom is this, 
raising up satanic worship in place of the worship of God. Raising up satanic worship in place of the worship of God. We said last time how the devil's hungry to receive worship. And to make this possible, he introduces false teaching. He creates false religions and gospels. He sends winds of doctrine into the church to distract and divide Christians. He gets people to rely on things other than the cross of Jesus for salvation, like good works and doing religious rituals. He substitutes entertainment and excitement for pure worship. When the process has gone far enough, he is able to eventually introduce other gods and he has people worship them. Listen, church, this is not a typo. The Hindus have 330 million gods. We can't obey the one sometimes. And one day this evil process is going to culminate in the worship of the world being directed towards a single man, the Antichrist. He will be the false Christ who will stand in opposition of everything that is called God. He will serve the dragon just as Jesus serves the Heavenly Father. And thank God we know the outcome of that. The Bible tells us that Jesus will destroy Antichrist with the brightness of his coming when he appears. The wicked will gather against Jesus, but Jesus will overcome, the Bible says, because he is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. Amen. Those are the devil's goals. That's what's important to him, but his goals will not be accomplished. All right, we've talked about the structure of the enemy's kingdom. We've talked about his goals. The third thing we need to understand about his kingdom is this. We need to understand the devil's time-tested tactics time-tested tactics of the enemy. What are his tactics? What is he doing in order to expand his influence and hold people under his sway? The first thing is this, it's temptation. It's temptation. We all know that the adversary tempts us to sin. He seeks to have us fall from our obedience to the Lord. If he can cause you to feel condemned, he will create inside of you a sense of shame that will keep you from coming back to God and getting cleansed. If he can defile our consciences, he will bring us into lower and lower places of degradation and shame. Church, we need to confess our sins to God quickly when we fall before they spiral out of control. Listen, nobody ever planned to become a thief. You remember when you were little in school? What do you want to be? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a bank robber. You don't hear that one. Sin is very deceptive. It's very gradual. It starts out small, but then it becomes a snowball and finally becomes a great avalanche that will carry away not only you, but those you care about. Another tactic the enemy uses in your life is deception. Deception. He uses deception in many areas, but most importantly, he's trying to blind people to the truth of the gospel. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. That's what he's concerned about. And that's one of his most powerful tactics. He makes you believe lies about yourself, lies about God, about salvation, lies about sin. He's the father of lies. But if he can't tempt you into sin, if he can't deceive you, he might take things up a notch in your life with with another tactic, which is this, persecution. Persecution. How many of you have heard the expression, it was used in the early church, it was said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of of the church. Have you heard that expression? Say that again. Get that in your mind. The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. And if that's the case, I believe we can expect a great harvest of souls all around the world because the fires of persecution of Christians have never been hotter. 
We are reaching a point where almost 200,000 people a year are being killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Persecution follows a familiar pattern set out for us by the Lord. It starts with mockery, and then it swells into harassment and intimidation. Finally, open persecution comes, and the hunting down of Christians begins. I believe that in America, we are now moving out of the stage of mockery and moving into the stage of harassment and intimidation. Church, let me be straight with you today. Men are now marrying men, and in today's America, you will not be allowed to say that that is not a good thing. If you own a bakery, for example, you may be sued or even arrested if you refuse to make a wedding cake for a homosexual couple. There's a man, there's a man who runs a bakery in the state of Colorado who may be facing a year in jail for doing just that. How free are you, America, and for how long? Christians, we need to use the religious liberties that we have because they may be fading fast. And while we're praying for ourselves, let's be sure also to pray for our fellow Christians in Egypt, Nigeria, and a whole host of other nations who are being killed because they have refused to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. A final tactic we need to think about is this. It's societal control. Societal control. Satan uses all of these tactics in order to create a web, to create systems of control in society. And he uses evil social structures to stay in power and to perpetuate his goals for a society. In other words, he creates structures that help him to stay in business. We can find many examples of this around the world in different time periods. We can think about things like apartheid in South Africa, slavery in America. We can think about the worldwide trade in abortion today, which has taken 1.7 billion lives over the past generation. There are other demonic systems too, which are religious in nature. They achieve Satan's goal by trying to snuff out the spread of the gospel and controlling people's lives. We think of Islamic nations which seek to regulate life to one degree or another, places like Iran or Pakistan or even Egypt more recently, controlling what can you do, what can you say, where can you go, what clothing can you wear, and all of these things. The devil also empowers strong men to rule nations and peoples. He raises up dictators and religious leaders with supernatural charisma to lead the nations away from Christ and lead them into false worship. Church, I want you to consider that history is full of villains who have operated with a supernatural power that was not their own. Hitler may be the best example of this, of course. He was of no account. He was not compelling. He was not winsome. But when that demonic anointing and empowerment came on him, people were spellbound by what he had to say, and it was demonic. He may be just the best example of that, but there have been many other men through history who have led their people to ruin while Satan looked on from the sidelines and laughed. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is is the Lord. We have a responsibility as Christians, whether you like the guy in office or whether you like the guy that was in office before him, Christians, we must pray, pray, pray for leaders and all who are in authority. Understand the enemy's tactics and be encouraged, church. Godly people in every century have overcome these things by leaning on Christ in prayer and in faith. Hebrews 11 says that it was through faith that the heroes of old subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouth of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they became strong. They became valiant in battle, and they turned to flight the armies of the foreigners. God will help us to overcome. God will help us to have victory, but it can only come through his power. It's not by might or power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. A fourth thing we need to understand about the enemy's kingdom is this. We need to understand the adversary's advantages. Understand the adversary's advantages. The enemy has quite a number of advantages in spiritual warfare that we cannot fight with 
carnal means that we can only fight with the holy weapons of warfare that God gives us. Certainly the enemy has the upper hand over those who don't serve the Lord Jesus. First, the devil has the advantage of owning the world system. We shared with you how Jesus called him the prince of this world. And currently he does have the right which he took from our father Adam to control the governments and systems of the world. Now that's not a very pleasant thought, but that's what Jesus' apostles taught us. The apostle John said in his first letter, 1 John 5, he said, we know that we are of God. How's that for confident Christianity? We know that we are of God, and he said, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. That's pretty blunt preaching right there, isn't it? The enemy also has the advantage of having blinded people's hearts through his deceptions. How many of you know, I think it's your experience maybe, as you go through the week, that very, people, very few people just come up to you randomly and say, Hey, what must I do to be saved? Very few people probably do that to you in the course of a week. Why is that? It's because they have been deceived by the devil as to the fact that they need salvation through Jesus Christ. The adversary has another advantage, and it's this, that men willingly give their allegiance to him because of sin. I've got a newsflash for the church this morning. People love sin. Jesus said so. How many Christians know John 3.16? Everybody knows John 3.16, but nobody knows John 3. 19. John 3, 19 says, Light has come into the world, and men loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Strong stuff from the Lord Jesus. And you see, that taking place in a person's heart gives the enemy a great advantage. Fallen men by nature, by their nature, fallen men will naturally stick up for sin. They will vote in favor of sin, they will argue in favor of sin, and they will support sinful deeds. Finally, the enemy has an advantage of having special servants, people who are devoted to his cause. Does God have his champions? Yes, and so does Satan. He has people who work hard to promote his glory. But thank God the Bible says, what is it that you are imagining against the Lord? He will make a complete end of it. And I want to tell you, church, that for every Goliath that comes out against the armies of the living God, there's a David somewhere who has five stones in his bag who's ready to take a giant out. So let's not be naive. Satan's advantages are real and they're significant. But David shows us that through boldness and faith, God can use little old you and little old me to overcome them. All right, everybody take a deep breath. Exhale. We've looked at the structure of the devil's kingdom, its goals, its tactics, and the advantages that it possesses. But before we go today, God wants you to understand one more aspect of the enemy's kingdom, and it's this. Understand that the devil's kingdom is destined for defeat. Amen. For all of its power, for all of the capabilities of war that the enemy's kingdom possesses, his kingdom will soon fall helpless under the power of God's judgments. As pastors, you know, we talk to a lot of people in the course of a week, in the course of a month, and I know that some people have been quite discouraged lately seeing the moral decay in society and seeing things that are going on. You see what's happening with young people, and it bothers you greatly. There's a pack of assassins out there, a pack of wolves that is tearing young people apart. Fatherlessness, drug abuse, casual sex, violence, fascination with the occult. These things are trying to destroy a generation. But I want you to know that the devil's time of running wild and free is going to come to an end someday. The Bible tells us in the second Psalm, very important portion of scripture, he, God, who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. The Lord is laughing at Satan's purposes, at what's in Satan's heart. Satan's downfall was foretold long ago. It was promised in the garden. It was sealed on the cross. 
And it's going to be made fully manifest one day soon when Jesus returns in great power and great glory. Daniel the prophet, we mentioned, he saw the Messiah in vision coming to earth and smashing every other kingdom that seeks to hold the throne of God, to take God's place. He saw the heavens opened. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 7. It says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. I don't know if you can see that well, but I really like that up there. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed Amen. we can see the defeat of satan's kingdom in three spheres of activity three spheres of life and we'll close with this pastor jason you can come back and help us if you would First, Satan has been defeated in the world or the world system. He's been defeated in the world system. Daniel chapter 7 shows us the defeat of the devil in the world system when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom on this earth. The cross set the stage for it, and now the clock is starting to tick down for the devil because Jesus is coming very soon. Church, I want you to put your thinking cap on with me here before we close and stay with me. I want you to think about this. In Jewish law, in biblical times, property that was mortgaged or that was lost to a creditor could be redeemed. It could be bought back for you by your relatives at a specified time. And the reason why God put that into the law was because he never wanted families to be permanently deprived of the inheritance that they received from God. You know, God parceled all of that land out to people individually, and he made a way in the law in the fullness of time when a certain time on the calendar came during the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, your relatives, your kinsmen had an opportunity to step forward and redeem property for you, to buy it back for you so that you would not permanently lose your property. Now that's a very beautiful thing that, that God built into that society. It's a very wonderful custom, but it's more than that. You see, that was a picture of Jesus. That was a picture of the salvation of the world. You see, church, this is how it was exactly so with planet Earth. Adam, our first father, lost the title to this world. He obeyed the enemy's temptations, and he lost the dominion, the right to rule this earth to the devil. But Jesus, your kinsman, Jesus, your redeemer, he came down, and at the price of his own blood, he won back the world from the wicked one. You have scripture for that, Pastor Nick? Oh, I absolutely do. When Jesus was preparing to die, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Praise Jesus. Through the cross, Jesus defeated the devil and he won back for the human race the right to run the world. Only this time it's not going to be managed by a fallible man who's going to fall through some temptation. It's going to be run by the perfect man. And there will never be danger of that authority. And the blessedness of that kingdom will never be lost again. Praise God. Jesus truly became the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A second sphere in which Satan is defeated is this. Not only will he fail to rule the world, he will fail in his attempts to deceive the nations of the earth. He's defeated in the nations of the world. He is already being defeated in the nations. I want you to know this truth, and it's an important truth. Satan possesses no ability to stop the spread of the gospel. He may delay it. He may cause us to take a few detours here and there in obeying the Great Commission. He may, for a time, even put us to sleep and make us forget temporarily the high calling of God in Jesus Christ that we have. But he can never stop the word of God from spreading.
See, my Bible says that God said his word would not return to him empty or void, but it will prosper in the thing that he sends it to. Now, we always grab a hold of that verse as a personal thing for our own lives. God's word is not going to return void, but it's going to prosper in me. But you know, when God speaks his word to a thing or a person or place, he's thinking bigger than just you. God says, I've sent my word to America and it will not return to me void. I sent my word to Brazil and it will not return to me void. I sent my word to Puerto Rico and Mexico and Argentina and Nigeria and France and Germany and Korea and it will not return to me void. It will prosper in the thing that I send it to. Paul experienced that reality. What did Paul say? He said, the word of God is not what? It's not bound. Christians, listen, persecution may come. Christians may sometimes be chained. Paul was chained when he wrote that. But the word of God cannot be chained. Dictators can't keep it out with laws or with iron curtains or anything like that. Persecutors can't destroy the word of God. Religious people can't pave it over with their religious rituals and traditions. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to all the nations for a witness and then the end will come. Is the church really going to be successful in taking the word of God to all the nations? Yes. And we have the personal promise of Christ on that. Already we can see the nations coming to him as never before. And if we had time today, I could take you through the book of Revelation and show you that at the end of the age, even the unsaved people who refuse to repent, who are standing under the judgment of God, they will know exactly who it is that's coming. And they will know exactly where those judgments are coming from. How will they know? Because the church is going to do its job. We're going to carry the message of Jesus to all the nations. The prophet Daniel was told by the angel, the time of the end, he said, how many of you know this? He said, the people who know their God are going to be strong and do exploits. Hallelujah. Let's make sure that we are a people who know their God. The devil's downfall is certain. He's going to be completely defeated in the world system. He's being defeated already in the nations. And finally this, the devil has been defeated in your life and in my life. How do I know that the devil's kingdom is not going to prevail in your life? Well, it's really very simple. See, if you belong to Jesus, the Bible says that God has already removed you out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred you over into the kingdom of his beloved son. Since that's the case, think about where that goes. Stop and think about this. The devil could not stop God from saving you even when you were his prisoner. Oh, I don't think you got that. The devil could not stop God from saving you even when you were the devil's prisoner. <laughs> Friend, Satan couldn't stop you from being saved. And that was the hard part. Some of you knew each other before Christ, you know, and uh, opening your eyes. You know how it used to be opening your eyes, changing your heart, getting you to bow the knee to Jesus. That was the hard part. If the devil couldn't stop you from being saved before you belong to God, why do we let ourselves get discouraged into thinking that he can ruin my life now that I do belong to God? Now that you are saved, he cannot stop you from fulfilling the purposes of God and bearing good fruit for the Lord in your life. Jesus said, you didn't even choose me, but I chose you so that you should go out and bear fruit and that it would be fruit that would remain in your life. The devil can't stop you from enjoying the victory of God and the abundant life that Jesus died to give you. Romans chapter 8, the portion right before the portion that we read today says, he that did not spare his own son, but gave him up freely for us all, how will he not now also, together with Jesus, freely give us all things? Satan can't keep you from heaven. He can't have your blessings. He can't have your life. He can't have your kids. He can't stop God from finishing his work in you. He who began a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And now that you belong to Jesus, 
All of the power of heaven is behind you and it's backing you and he's pulling for you and the wind of the Holy Spirit is filling your sails. So church, don't be afraid and don't give up and don't be discouraged when you see that the enemy's powerful kingdom has come out against you and formed itself for battle. Don't be alarmed or intimidated. Keep on pursuing God. Keep on testifying for Jesus. Keep sharing. Keep sharing the good news of Jesus. Remember those wonderful words that we started with in Romans 8. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Church, we have a great victory that's been promised to us both in this life and in the age to come. And you have God's personal Guarantee that Satan's plans and purposes for your life are going to fail because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Come on, stand and give Jesus a great praise and thank him that he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. Come on, lift up a shout and bless Jesus. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Oh, be thankful unto him and bless his name. We worship you, Jesus. Because the enemy has been defeated. And death couldn't hold. soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, I want you to lift your hands up. Everybody, lift up both hands to the Lord. Just begin to worship him. Just begin to thank him. Just begin to acclaim him as king. Jesus, we adore you. We say, we say that you are king of kings and lord of lords. You're the son of righteousness, God, and you're risen with healing in your wings. We give you the honor, Lord, that you deserve. We join with your holy angels and we give honor and praise and reverence to the wonderful name of Jesus in this house. We magnify you, Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for removing us from the kingdom of darkness and making us to become citizens of the beautiful kingdom of heaven. The way to make sure that the enemy's purposes don't prevail in your life is to make sure you're part of God's family first. See, it also says in Romans 8 that God will cause all things to work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. Make sure you've given your heart to the Lord Jesus and you can experience that. You can walk in the purposes of God. We've talked about it. Satan has a plan for your life and so does the Lord. Whose plan would you rather live out? Joshua gave the best answer centuries ago. That would be my answer. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. So if you're here today and you're not really sure, you're not 100% sure that you know that you have a personal relationship with God and Jesus through Jesus Christ, we're going to pray. We're going to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus to become the king and the Lord of your heart today. I want to pray a prayer just inviting people to surrender their lives to Jesus. I want you all to join with me and we'll help some people maybe who are here who want to pray and invite Jesus to become king of their heart today. Come on, pray this with me. Say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I'm sorry for my sins. I need your forgiveness and your abundant life. Jesus, I confess you as Lord. I turn from my own ways now. I believe that God has raised you from the dead for me. Forgive my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. And let me live for you every day. 
Amen and amen. Give him a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you prayed a prayer like that for the first time today, then right after we conclude our service in just a few moments, I want to invite you to come. There'll be some friends here to pray with you, to meet you, and we want to give you some materials that will just help you get started in a new life of following the Lord. And we want to pray for everybody else who's here today, and maybe you're weary from the battle. That's what I heard from the Lord today. We need to pray for people who are weary from the battle. How many of you are just just a little worn out from from battle, from, from life today? Look at that. I want to pray that the Lord's going to give us fresh strength and fresh vision to be able to see these schemes of the enemy coming at us from afar off. I want to ask if you would just quickly place your hands over your eyes, if you would, and I want to pray for everybody today. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would give your people the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Lord, let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. God, that we may know what is the hope of your calling, that we may know what is the glory of the riches of your inheritance in the saints. And Lord, that we may know and experience the surpassing greatness of your power toward us as believers. Father, I pray that you would make us wise and discerning. I pray that you would give us sharp spiritual vision. Father, I pray that you would expose in our lives the plans and the traps of the enemy, the things that he has prepared for us. And let us see them afar off. Let his schemes and his plans become obvious to us. Father, I pray that when temptation comes, Lord, when deception comes, Lord, that you'll make us wise and give us spiritual sight, give us grace so that we don't take the bait that Satan is dangling in front of us. Come on, lift your hands up to the Lord again, if you would. And Father, I pray for fresh strength for your people today. Give us strength for the battle. Renew us. Lord, we remember how David prayed. He said, blessed be the Lord my God who strengthens my hands for war. Your word tells us, Lord, to lift up the hands that are hanging down and to strengthen the knees that have become feeble. So, Father, I pray for a new vitality today from the Holy Spirit for each one of us here. Lord, we may be weary from battle, but, God, we're standing on your word that encourages us and tells us that as we wait upon you, Lord, as we go before you in worship, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. And, God, we believe and we confess and we declare over our own lives today that your power is more than enough to enable us to stand strong in the face of temptation, in the face of the deception of the enemy, and God, even persecution, should it come our way. Father, we thank you that there's no enemy that can stop the spread of your word. There's no enemy, Lord, that can stop your powerful word from coming to pass in our lives. Jesus, you're building your church, and we thank you for your promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him thanks. Let's sing that song again, and let's declare that the enemy's been defeated and Jesus reigns. Come on, sing it. Because the enemy has been defeated and death couldn't hold you down. We're going to lift our voice in victory. We're going to make your praises loud. Because the enemy has been defeated and death couldn't hold you down, you're gonna 